Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm recording this on August 6th, 2024. So I'd like to talk about what happened last night. There was a U.S. military base that was attacked in our, in, that, that's in Iraq. I'm assuming it was attacked by um, proxy forces from Iran. So let's play some of those videos from different news agencies. I don't see a whole lot of it coming up in the business news or even Al Jazeera did a little bit about it this morning. Um, recording this before the open in the market. And just to give you a little bit of an update, last night, Japan's Nikkei mean reverted uh, and rallied uh, 10%. So the prior uh, trading day, uh, it went down 12%. So it nets you know, roughly, you know, um, you know, it, it almost recovered most of its its losses. So, is this a one off? Is the sell off in in Asia a one off? Europe didn't didn't have too much of a sell off. It was down by two or three percent in some of the of the indices on that uh, that sell off cycle around the world. Um, United States closed. Um, relatively benign i mean it, you know it was down a little bit but um it wasn't like that much of a catastrophe the futures market is up uh last i looked it was five that for the s p 500 it was 5230 ish um bitcoin is uh, about fifty four thousand eight hundred. there's been some fluctuation with bitcoin so and oil, oil is trading at 72.31, so it is a little bit suppressed. So that's basically where the market is. It's stable, all right? Right now, it's stable. Even the, the VIX is at, uh, right now, because it's, it's at 32, but the market hasn't opened up. I suspect that the VIX will be below that when, when, when the market does open up in about 30 minutes or so. But it's the whole point here is just not to panic. Everything's fine. Don't worry about it. Like I said, there's a support level for the S and P 500 at about five thousand, and there, there's another support level at four thousand eight hundred and thirty or eight four thousand eight hundred and twenty. There's another support level at four thousand five hundred and seventy. And then another one at 4,300. So I wouldn't, there, it's not going to like fall out of bed and everything's going to be helter skelter. All right. But this might be a signal for something in October that might take place. Will the Federal Reserve do emergency rate cut? No. A lot of people on X thought this was like the big event. It's not. So, and I said that yesterday when I did my broadcast, watch that broadcast and exactly how I was saying it would play out, played out. All right. Um, so with that said, um, let's play some of the videos. But before we do that, please go to my store, the-studio-rakevic.com. I have lots of different products. And uh, please go and, and look at those products, but also please make sure you subscribe to the four channels that I have on YouTube, Braytown, BitChute, and Rumble. So I have seven total channels. All the links are in the description of this video. In addition, if you could, please help support my, my work. I have thousands of videos that are free because of the people that help support what I do. You can support by being a paid member on Patreon, the link is in the description of this video. And you can support by donating on my website, the-studio-rakevic.com. You can donate through Stripe, PayPal, or buy me a coffee. With that said, with that said, let's um, let's play some videos. Hey, 
got Shitty Vance here, your VP nominee for campaigning in Boston, Nevada today. Bad news is that Kamala and Harris has raised close to $200 million. All right, now we've got vendor hooks in the Middle East right now. Iran has already promised to avenge uh, the attack that took out a, a, a top Hamas leader uh, a little more than days after we saw the Hezbollah leader in Beirut also taken out. So there are a lot of Iranian proxies at play, and we, of course, have been boosting our presence in the region. Uh, General Jack came with us to, to assess where this stands. General, good to have you. Um, what do you make of where things stand right now? Could be just moments away, days away. Yeah, well, certainly Iran is going to conduct uh, some kind of retaliation. I think their motivation is going to be uh, clearly they've got to improve on what they did the last time, despite the fuselage of some 300 drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. Their entire attack was largely ineffective. They clearly were seeking damage to infrastructures and also uh, a killing and wounding of Israeli people, and, and they achieved neither of those. So that, it, what have they learned from that? One is, you know, launching drones from as far away as Iran, giving uh, the U.S.-led coalition and the Israelis four to five hours to wait and intercept those, and that was done by U.S. airplanes, Brits, French, and Jordanian airplanes, largely over Jordanian airspace, and one of all of that coming, certainly, by the Arab nations who have sensors and radars doing that. So there was a lot of participation in that. But then, Neil, remarkably, uh, rockets and missiles has a priority inside of Iran's conventional military. I believe their army, their air power, and their navy is relatively weak. But they resource rockets and missiles. And our estimate is about 50% of those malfunction. Can you imagine that? So they're going to try to certainly improve on that. And I think one of the ways they're going to improve on it is likely use some of the proxies that are as far away, particularly Hezbollah, who's, who lost their leader in an Israeli uh, assassination as well. And obviously they have proximity. They also have long range weapons. They have lethality much greater than what Hamas has. And they have precision much greater than Hamas. Now, whether, the, whether Iran goes beyond that to the Houthis and Iraqi, uh, Iranian backed Shia militia uh, is another thing. All of those options are available to them. But what they're seeking here certainly is damage to infrastructure and, and certainly uh, damage also to Israeli citizens. That has got to be uh, their objective. Now, it doesn't make much for this thing to escalate into a full regional war. I, I'm surprised it hasn't already with the repeated Uri rebel attacks on, on shipping interests in and around that, that, that neck of the woods. Uh, and, of course, they're an Iranian proxy, as is Hezbollah, as is Hamas. Um, so the, the spread was already there. I guess the response will determine how much more it spreads, right? Yeah, well, certainly, what kind of retaliation it excuse me, Israel does, is largely dependent on how successful Iran's attack is. I mean, if there is a considerable amount of casualties, that will certainly impact Israel's response. I do believe, Neil, though, despite the obvious, that there is potential for escalation, and certainly the administration and others are going out of their way to, to try to minimize the impact of, uh, of escalation. The, the Iranians really do not want a direct war with the United States and Israel. And the reason is, is because they don't have the capability to deal with that. And I pointed out before, based on the weakness of the conventional military, after all, their 45-year strategy, which has had a payoff for them, is to use proxies for them, all beginning all the way back to this, just got accepted more this week as a reminder of blowing up the marine barracks in 1983 using the proxies, right. taking down our embassies in the area as such. This proxy war that they've used all of these years to drive the United States out of the region, reduce our presence, and also to attempt to destroy the state of Israel has been much more effective than a direct conflict themselves. And I think they're going to continue to pursue the proxy war and avoid at all costs, a direct conflict with Israel and the United States. 
Mr. C, General, thank you very much. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here right, to subscribe to Fox News Ute. Okay, the next one I want, I'm going to look at is this one here. Want to trade Bitcoin plus oil plus gold plus S&P 500 plus so much more? Let me introduce you to Plus 500. All right, meanwhile, uh, 17 minutes after the hour, Fox News American troops are hurt after a rocket attack on Al Assad Air Base over in Western Iraq yesterday. Trey Yates joins us live from Israel uh, Port City, uh, Afia. Uh, he's live with us right now. Hey, Trey. I mean, in terms of the yeah, hey. in terms of the mainstream media, not some of the more uh, less known media. I think Trey does a really good job in terms of. journaling what's going on in the Middle East, in the most part. I think he does a, a pretty fair, fair job on it. Good morning. I do want to start with some breaking news. As Israel braces for an attack from Iran and its proxies, the largest proxy in the region, Hezbollah, in southern Lebanon, just launched a rocket and drone attack into northern Israel, just a few miles from where we're standing right now. According to reports from first responders, Two people were injured by shrapnel, one critically wounded and taken to a local hospital. But it gives you a sense that while Israel is preparing for that larger conflict, they're still being attacked on a daily basis. We're also following this other update out of the region overnight in Iran-backed militia targeting a base in western Iraq that houses American forces. Multiple U.S. service members were injured in that attack, again, launched by a militia that's backed by Iran. The timing of that incident couldn't have occurred at a worse moment as tensions rise across the Middle East. President Biden was at the White House being updated on the expected Iranian attack that is planned against Israel when that took place. The commander in chief posting to X that he was brief and there are efforts to de-escalate the situation. Going on to say we also discussed the steps we are taking to defend our forces and respond to any attack against our personnel in a manner and place of our choosing. The question now is how the United States will respond and what role the Americans will play in defending Israel. Iranian officials briefed our ministers of other countries yesterday and confirmed they do plan to strike Israel in response to the killing of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran. This comes as the war in Gaza grinds on and we are following a new development about the United Nations. The UN announced yesterday it had fired nine UNRWA staffers for suspected involvement in the October 7th massacre. Right now, there are simply no diplomatic solutions on the table to end the war inside Gaza, de-escalate with Hezbollah in Lebanon, and avoid a larger attack from Iran, meaning Israel is bracing for uncertain and dangerous days ahead. Guys, hey, Trey, why would they list, what do you think Iran, why would they list the possible sites they're going to hit ahead of time? What are they trying to do? They're trying to play a game. <laughs> well, I think mean, it's obvious. One make the list and potentially reduce the chances of casualties so they look a little bit better on the international stage. And it's an eye for an eye thing that's going on between Iran and, and it, Israel. Um, but I do think that, October, like I said, August, September, October, November, December, January are months that are strong for Esau. Those, those are months that are strong for for um, Iran and weak for Israel, also weak for the United States. So uh, this thing's going to grind on, and the the peak strength for Esau is in October. Well, we keep on hearing about October surprises. A lot of things happen at you know in that September October for time frame where. You have an ascent of strength with Esau, Kabbalistically, with this whole metaphysics. Um, and this is, it's going to go back and forth, back and forth. And I think that there's going to be, uh, uh, as Israel's preparing its stage invasion and heavy bombardment of Lebanon, um, this is just going to accelerate more and more. Now, will that be in October, past November? Are they just preparing for major escalation right after the elections in the United States, which is the, the first week of November? 
who knows? I mean, they, they need time to regroup. Israel need, needs time to regroup and, and start, you know, preparing major opera, major operations in the Northern Front. It, maybe it takes some time. Uh, there's political problems that are going on internally in Israel. Um, there are groups that want to bring the hostages home and de-escalate the war. There are others that want to continue on the war. Um, there's this infighting between the religious scholars not wanting to be drafted into the military to fight. So there's a lot of internal and the external variables involved on, you know, as this Northern Front starts to become more and more heated. And I, I think that this is not gonna be, oh, Iran hits, Israel hits back and it'll be done. No, it, I think this is gonna slowly involve uh, more escalation. What is sad, and this really proves that the White House is uh, somewhat inept, is you don't hear all of the news, the condemnation of our Iraq base getting hit. No, no, no. We're we're seeing in the news Kamala Harris announces Tim Waltz. I don't even know who Tim Waltz is. All right. I thought it was gonna be Shapiro, but but all right, I guess it looks like it's Tim Waltz now. But They're more worried about Harris and the running mate for Harris than the actual bombing of an American base in Iraq. This is the problem with Biden's foreign policy. It just it just seems like they're the, the, it's inept. And strange thing is, I don't understand why everyone in that administration has to read from a cue card. All right. Um, okay. So let's continue on with the video. Here. Psychological warfare with the Israeli people, and the Israelis are doing the same. They have made very clear that if the Iranians target civilian areas of Israel in cities like Haifa, where we're at today, or Tel Aviv, or Jerusalem, the Israelis will respond, striking Iran again. And remember, Iran launched an attack against Israel in April, firing more than 300 drones and missiles at this country. And while many were intercepted by coalition forces, the Israelis struck back against a very interesting target air defense systems outside of Iran's nuclear facility, the largest one in the country. This was to send a message. The Israelis know exactly where they're developing their nuclear program, and it's in their sights. All right, Trey, we thank, thank you very much. Uh, also, the United States is uh, sending a message as well. The USS Laboon and the USS Cole have been repositioned in the Red Sea, and the uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, aircraft carrier group is moving toward Israel as well. The big stick. That wow. goes back to the question, why isn't Kamala Harris, why isn't Joe Biden, why are we hearing from them when you have all of this happening in the Middle East? We and got this a is tweet what, picture. Yeah, it was Selena Zito. She she posted this. Uh, mark it down. How many thousand? I want to go to Al Jazeera because it looks like there's something breaking. Here. You strike again uh, that's significant as Israel anticipates this Hezbollah retaliation. But Israel has struck southern Lebanon today. They've hit the town of uh, Mefadun, which is roughly eight kilometers from the border. We've been in apparent airstrike. Now, the authorities say five people, five people killed, killed in that attack. Now, what's significant about that attack, possibly significant, is that there are reports that Amin Badruddin was killed. Now, he's the nephew of former top Hezbollah commander Mustafa Badruddin. Uh, who was killed in an attack in 2016 in Syria. Now, we're still waiting for confirmation, but Israel has also attacked a town called Odessa, which is not far from where I am here. Uh, one person was killed, and also uh, another strike on the town of Qiyam, which is less than a kilometer away from me, right behind me. One person was injured. Now, what we understand from Hezbollah's statements and attacks this today are that this isn't a part of the main retaliation that Hezbollah has promised in response to the killing of their senior commander, Fawad Shukar. Now, the general secretary of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrullah, is expected to speak later today, roughly about an hour uh, from now. Uh, and as, as, as the world and the region awaits for this promised Hezbollah retaliation, now, the Lebanese foreign minister 
Mustafa Bohabil has said that Lebanon is working uh, to ensure the response to the Israeli killing of top Hezbollah commander does not lead or trigger a war in the Middle East. Now, that's a real fear here, not just in Lebanon, but the entire region. All right, thank you very much. As of today, we're putting to us from Raja Ul in southern Lebanon. Well, the Israeli government has banned Al Jazeera from reporting from Israel, so Zain Bastravi joins us instead from Jordan's capital, Amman. What might be the significance then of uh, Hezbollah being able to hit accurately, hit strategically important sites in northern Israel? Well, it's significant because Hezbollah is able to maintain a consistent and incredibly challenging pressure campaign by way of these strikes on northern Israel. And to that point, just in the last 30 or 40 minutes, really in the last hour, we've seen yet another series of sirens going off in at least three towns in northern Israel, reports of sirens going off in, uh, in other parts of northern Israel, as well, drones flying overhead. Some reports that one drone did explode, whether it was shot down by Israeli missiles or not, whether any of those sirens resulted in more uh, Hezbollah ground strikes on Israel, that is still unclear. But what is clear is that Hezbollah is able to penetrate quickly and deeper into Israel, and the Israeli Iron Dome, once thought impenetrable, is simply not functioning as Israelis would like it to. To that end, the Israeli forces have confirmed that reports of, and I'm quoting from their social media channel here, reports of a fallen hostile aircraft on Route 4 in an area south of Nahariya. This is one of the major explosions that took place on northern Israel today. An initial inquiry indicates that it was an interceptor, mis interceptor missile uh, that hit its target and hit the ground, injuring several civilians, and the Israeli military is investigating what ended up being its own missile landing on its own territory, injuring so many people. So in the, at the same time as Hezbollah is able to show that it is able to carry out more sophisticated, more probing attacks on northern Israel, Israel's own defense systems don't seem to be working as they, as they would like it to. Okay, thank you very much. Same with Strabi reporting to us from Amman in Jordan. Let's speak now to Amir Oren, who's a columnist for Hearts, a newspaper focusing on military and government affairs. He's normally based in Tel Aviv, but uh, today he's joining us from New York. Thank you for speaking to us on the Al Jazeera News Hour. So, what do you make of? Thank you, Marian. What do you make then of the target of Hezbollah's strike in northern Israel? Well, as you know, for the last uh, three hundred odd days, Hezbollah has been operating under two. He's on the Israeli channels a lot, I, uh, like. ITV and um, Israeli Live, I think is the name of it. Predictory vectors. I didn't know you were saying um, New York. On the one hand, it was to help Hamas and to join the fight and uh, divert attention and forces uh, that Israel has at its disposal from Gaza to the Lebanese border and therefore uh, give its share in what it sees as the uh, joint resistance fight against Israel. But on the other hand, it uh, behooves him not to go the influence Israel into a full flare, uh, full scale war, because then uh, Iran, its patron, will lose its Hezbollah arm. Obviously, should Israel invade Lebanon or hit it with its full might, Hezbollah will be shattered and the reserves which Iran has been positioning north of Israel for the day when it has nuclear weapons will no longer be there. So it's a very delicate game that Nasrallah has been playing. He is calling it uh, equations. If Israel hits a certain target, he will try to hit a parallel target in Israel. If Israel hits a military commander uh, in Hezbollah, he is trying to find the right person to retaliate against, but again, short of a full-scale war. You say short of a full-scale war, but the suggestion is that we have not seen yet the collective response that has been anticipated following the assassination of uh, Fuad Shuk and uh, Ismail Haniya. So and that is expected to be a, a collective response, I suppose. Uh, what are Israel's options now 
if its security situation continues to deteriorate? Well, you know, uh, long before we had uh, SMS and WhatsApp and what have you, we used to uh, talk about telegraphing our punches. No one uh, apparently uses telegraph anymore, but this is what Iran and Hezbollah have been doing for the last eight days. Since July the 30th, they've been talking about retaliation, so that means that there is no surprise attack in the offing, and therefore no need for Israel to preempt. Had Israel seen um, a real move towards uh, pulling the trigger, um, as it may, Israel would have pulled its own trigger first. It seems all very choreographed in order for a response uh, to be taken, perhaps for domestic uh, reasons uh, primarily, but not to be so severe as to escalate into regional. So the, the Israeli government is waiting to see the timing and the scope of the Iranian response before choosing how it will counterattack. And uh, to see how its own defense um, array has been able to deal uh, with this uh, attack. And as we saw in the Marjayun attack um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Saturday last week, if it so happens that uh, a single rocket penetrates the defense and kills 12 boys and girls, Israel had uh, no other reports but to respond. But had this particular rocket been intercepted and no one would have been uh, injured, we wouldn't have seen this uh, escalation. So it all depends on the impact, the uh, damage, the injuries, and um, only then can you uh, analyze the consequences. Amir Omar, thank you very much for joining us from New York. Thank you. Surprising. In other developments, 12 Palestinians have been killed during Israeli raids in the occupied West Bank. Four were killed near two bus late. So here, you're also hearing the West Bank stuff going on, too. So, it's, like I said, this is going to be, this is going to be a multi-front war. It's not just Gaza. The points since last Wednesday. Back to Fox. The Middle East is at the brink of a war. Iran bombed our military base in Iraq. How is it okay that we haven't heard from the president? How is it that the White House correspondents aren't publicly calling for this? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Don't you want to do your job? Aren't you frustrated that you can't get any questions off? Don't you want to know why the flip-flops happened? But the same thing, there was no clamor for President Biden to do no. a press conference. That's exactly right. Well, until the, 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 the information yesterday, we were teasing it on every program, that there was going to be this big national security meeting, that everybody was going to be made, the council was going to be in the bunker, really laying it out in the situation room. And I guess we assumed that there was going to be some type of public statement after absolutely nothing. No press conference, no red line for America. It looks like the only people that are getting the pressure is the Israelis right now saying, just get a deal done. Well, yesterday, the press secretary didn't even have her normal no. uh, gaggle. She does have one plan for this. They're always so informative. It'll, it'll be interesting to see what they have to say about this, about the two things about what's going on in Iran and also what is going on with your 401k. Oh. I'm Steve Juicy. I'm Brian Kilney. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. All right, so let's see here. If there's one other thing. Yeah, it's Let's do live now. This was recorded over. See that I have two years. really big monitors on here, as well as my tower, which by itself weighs like 50 pounds. Uplift desk can't handle. All right, welcome back in here to live now from Fox. I'm Andy Mack. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's turn our attention now to some breaking news on the international front. I do want to put up this tweet here on live now from Fox from Jennifer Griffin. Fox News reporter there covering the Pentagon uh, breaking news as two defense officials tell Fox News several U.S. troops are injured following a rocket attack at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. The statement from the U.S. defense official saying in full, we can confirm that there was a suspected rocket attack today against U.S. and coalition 
forces at al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Initial indications are that several U.S. personnel were injured. Base personnel are conducting a post-attack damage assessment. We will provide updates as more information becomes available. So we're just very preliminary right now of a rocket attack. An Iraqi military base injures several U.S. personnel uh, here on this Monday. The attack comes as tensions across the Middle East spike and following the killings last week of a senior Hezbollah commander in Lebanon and Hamas's top political leader in Iran and suspected Israeli attacks. Both groups are backed by Iran. Also from Aisha Hosni saying U.S. Navy ships are being strategically placed in the Middle East as Israel braces for retaliation. We've been covering it significantly for quite some time. All right, so just that map of the Middle East, tensions continue to rise. The U.S. defense officials said troops in Al-Assad Air Base were still assessing the injuries and damages. Early Monday, Iraqi security officials confirmed the attack, but no group has yet claimed responsibility. And we've talked about the tensions that continue to rise in the region. We've been patiently, potentially waiting over the weekend for retaliation after uh, several assassinations of a senior Hezbollah commander and also a top a Moss political leader. For more on this, let's go up to Fox News correspondent Rebecca Castor that gets up to speed on this Monday of those growing tensions. President Biden and Vice President Harris sitting down with the National Security Council in the Situation Room one day to discuss the latest developments in the Middle East. Israel and the Iranian-backed militant group Hezbollah have exchanged strikes frequently since war broke out in Gaza nearly 10 months ago. But the fighting could soon reach a new level after two high-level assassinations last week. A Hezbollah commander in Beirut and a political leader of Hamas in Iran's capital. Deaths Iran has vowed to avenge. When the Supreme Leader says he's going to avenge, we have to take that seriously. Now, I don't know what they're going to do or when they're going to do it, but we got to make darn sure that we're ready. Over the weekend, the United States deployed an additional fighter jet and Navy warships to the region. And President Biden and his team are working the phones to ensure other partners in the region, such as Jordan and Sudan, are committed to de-escalating tensions and encouraging a ceasefire. We are at a critical moment for the region, and it is important that all parties take steps over the coming days to refrain from escalation and calm tensions. And in another headline from the Middle East, the United Nations announced nine staff members have been fired for their involvement in the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. In Washington, Rebecca Castor, Fox News. All right, thank you so much for that. We're continuing to monitor the latest developments on that front. I also want to put up this post from Liz Frieden there on uh, the Pentagon covering it for Fox, saying uh, Delta flight between the New York JFK and Tel Aviv will be paused through August of the 31st due to ongoing conflicts in the region. This is according to the airline. In a... They just signaled something through August. No travel from JFK to Tel Aviv, right? And like I said, you know, this is going to increase. This activity is going to increase. Both sides are starting to arm up, and, and, and something more, something a little bit more major is going to happen. I'll continue playing some videos, but I need to do a commercial break for PNN. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the structural nano silver soaps that I have. I have uh, a variety of types, but uh, this one that I'm showing is charcoal tea tree. So please go to the store, get the get a couple bars for your household. They're very high quality. I have structural nano silver gel. I have it in two types. I have it in the tube form and I also have it in a dispenser that you can carry in a bag. All right. And they're dual purpose products. What you do is you basically put it on your hands if you're concerned about contracting a pathogen. So it neutralizes pathogens, but you can also put it around your face, or, you know, around your mouth, around your nose, eyes, ears. And um, by doing that, you're blocking, you know, these pathogens, you're neutralizing these pathogens. You can also lightly coat it in your, in your nostrils. In addition, you can put the structural nano silver gel on a wound. Like a, like a cut 
or an abrasion or a minor burn, and it will heal quicker. Uh, in addition, you can put it as a skincare, daily skincare, where you put it on. The best way to do it is you put it on, and you leave it on overnight. So you put it on before you go to bed. And then when you wake up in the morning, you exfoliate, and you'll notice that your skin is clearer and tighter, especially on your face. So please go to my store and get the structural nano silver gels that I have, that I offer. They're very high quality and they are dual purpose products. I have structural nano silver liquids. I have Max 35, Max 14, and the structural nano silver solution that is uh, uh, 30 ppm. Max 14 is 14 ppm, and Max 35 is 35 ppm. They're all at different price points for, for your convenience. So what you do is you take a teaspoon of this a day. If you're not feeling well, take a tablespoon or two a day. How you do it is you just swish it in your mouth for about 20 seconds, gargle, and then swallow. Do that every day, and it'll neutralize pathogens and maintain the mucosal barrier. We're going to be going into the cold season, and... Um, most likely this cold season is going to be um, elevated. So what I suggest you, you do is go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the drops that I offer and the lozenges. I have the drops in honey and lemon and in blueberry in 100 count. And I have the lozenges in 0.1 count elderberry zinc. Get a couple bags of these for your household just so you're ready, because the moment that you start feeling that irritation, you want to be able to use, a, use some lozenges or some drops, and you're neutralizing the pathogen, because it has the structural nano silver in it, but you're also sec secreting, and you're protecting the mucosal layer of your epithelium. By doing that, you're reducing the chances of contracting something worse, right? So if you if you have a if you have irritation in your epithelium, uh, if you have uh, inflammation in your epithelium, what will happen is you're increasing the chances of contracting something. So you want to maintain that. That's the reason why using the liquid every day is really important to maintain that barrier and to neutralize pathogens. But the moment you start feeling a little bit of an irritation. Hit it with some lozenges right away, and you're reducing the chances of it getting worse. And for the ones that haven't already purchased, if you're getting the structural nano silver liquid, go to this, go to my store, and also get this, the three applicator set. It has a spritzer, uh, a dropper, and a nasal spray. That way, you can put the liquid. And just put the liquid inside these bottles and carry it with you in your bag. And you can spray surfaces, you can spray the back of your throat, you can use the dropper, you know, to, to put some structural nano silver liquid in your throat or a nasal spray. So this is a very good product. Please go to the store. It'll help you transport the structural nano silver in your bag or in your backpack. All right, so now I want to go to the next video on this series. Okay, this is CEC. In a way, like every delivery is a treat. <laughs> Something minty? Of course. During several U.S. personnel, the Pentagon reports a damage assessment is currently underway. I want to bring in our ABC News senior Pentagon reporter, Louis Martinez. He's joining us now from the Pentagon uh, with more on this. So, uh, Louis, look, I know that this is early, but what other information do we have about this attack here? You know, what we are learning from U.S. and Iraqi officials is that there are at least two rockets that were fired at the al-Assad base. Now, this is a sprawling base in western Iraq. It's 
frequently under attack over the last year and a half, especially since uh, what happened is it, over there in Israel between Hamas uh, and Israel. Now, one of the things that we've seen here is that we are getting initial indications that several American personnel were injured. Now, this is quite different than the norm because typically when these acts, when these incidents occur, there we get word that there are very few casualties, if any. Typically, the rockets either don't reach the base or if they do, there are no injuries. But in this case, so if we have injured personnel, don't you think the president of the United States needs to get up, you know, on stage and start taking questions? Um, not above, which is why this is very noteworthy, and it's very notable to figure out exactly what's going to be the next step. Because last week, the United States retaliated against one of those militia groups as they were preparing to launch missiles or rockets from south in an area southwest of Baghdad. Um, and that followed a recent series of about two incidents in one week where those Iranian-backed militia groups had fired at U.S. bases. Those attacks were the first ones since April, and the ones in April the, uh, were the first since back in February. And back in February, uh, like almost daily attacks in Iraq and Syria stopped following U.S. airstrikes. So the question now becomes, how will the United States military respond? And uh, based on past practice, I think it is very likely that we may see some kind of a retaliatory strike. However, given, this, given the climate right now and what's happening with Team Iran and Israel, and whether Iran will retaliate potentially against Israel uh, because of the assassination of, of the Hamas leader in Tehran, I think things have to be seen through a different prism. And I think that's something that the U.S. leaders will definitely look at. Uh, right. And we, and we know from the G7, Louis, we're hearing things like we urge all involved parties to once again refrain from perpetu perpetuating the current destructive cycle of retaliatory violence. Uh, but when you hear this, Louis, and now we have American servicemen and women uh, potentially injured here, I'm curious how you're assessing this responsibility is a heavy word. We don't know who, but we know that we've been seeing, uh, you know, our forces go up against these Iranian proxies. But there's also Iranian-backed militia groups in both Iraq and Syria. Any speculation that they're responsible here? Typically, they look at one particular group called Qatar Hezbollah. Uh, they're the group that has been prominently backed by Iran. They are the ones that were most responsible for the more than 170 attacks against U.S. personnel, both in Iraq and Syria, since last October. And so when the United States looks at this, they look and try to figure out who... Uh, the VIX index with the market that opened up about seven minutes ago, it's in, in the 30s, it's about 30, 32. So that's, it's elevated. But the market overall is did open up higher. Um, right now, the S&P 500 is trading at 5,206. Who launched the attack, whether they are backed by Iran, and then in this case, uh, most prominently, it will be, and most likely will be, Qatar and Hezbollah. Now, again, the United States has responded in the past uh, militarily against Qatar and Hezbollah launching strikes. And one of the re main reasons why those um, dozens and dozens of attacks stopped back in early February was because the United States uh, launched a high-profile attack against the well, senior leader of the militia group. And that strike followed those big retaliatory strikes that we saw um, after the deaths of three American soldiers inside of Syria at uh, Tower 22. So these would be the first American casualties since that incident, and I think we kind of have to look at it again. Is this going to trigger another U.S. military response against these militia groups? <laughs> Let's take a listen and to this one right here. When I heard I was approved by one name, I was very relieved. I was ecstatic. I just felt like a ton of weight was lifted off my shoulders. Do you see it? The cream colored columns are made of solid marble with exuberant brass reliefs imported directly from Italy. Civilians who just want to live their lives free from violence and conflict.
Go back to Frank's. Okay, let's. I, I want to. I so want to go to this. It was scheduled to be the first uh, stop on this battleground tour that the two will now go on over the course of the next four days, uh, where they will hit up all of those battleground states: Wisconsin, uh, Georgia, Nevada. So here is Pick's Walls. For VP, Carolina as well. So it is. Um, it, we were told not to read into the fact that it was in Pennsylvania, obviously the home state of Josh Shapiro, the other person who was in contention for this running. Uh, and it appears that that was some good advice not to read too much into that because indeed she has gone the other way. Uh, but uh, Minnesota, not really a battleground state, it is in some respect. There has been. A, it is a thin margin that the Democrats are holding on to there. But a lot of analysts are saying that if you're in trouble in uh, Minnesota, you're, you're definitely in trouble elsewhere. So uh, Minnesota, not necessarily a battleground state, but what um, the governor, Tim Balls, has learned during his time as governor so there dumb. in his now two terms, he is hoping to bring to that ticket to uh, sell to the other people in those battleground states. And that is also why like Kamala Harris wants to on the ticket as well. Fraser Jackson reporting uh, live. Many thanks for that update. We'll be crossing over uh, to you after we have confirmation uh, on that news that uh, Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz is Kamala Harris's running mate. Iraq's military condemns what it calls reckless actions against U.S. bases on its soil as the region braces for retaliation by Iran against Israel over the assassination in Tehran last week of Hamas political leader Ismail Hine. And in the wake of the attack that uh, wounded five uh, U.S. personnel on Monday, Baghdad saying, it's now captured a truck with a rocket launcher. Meanwhile, Hezbollah launching a series of drone and rocket attacks into northern Israel, all the while warning its much anticipated retaliation for Israel's killing of a top commander last week is yet to come. The prospect of a second front after 10 months of war in Gaza, putting a strain on Israelis. Here's Marcos, our correspondent in Jerusalem. We have seen the CENTCOM chief, uh, General Carrilla, here, that the United States CENTCOM chief. Here um, yesterday, I think it's his ninth visit to the region since the October the 7th attacks last year. Uh, and he's coordinating the Israeli and international defense for Israel against rocket attacks or incoming, you know, missiles, as well as rockets, as well as drones, of course. Uh, we've seen today the Rus Russian defense minister, Sobert Shogu, in Iran, and Iranian sources telling the New York Times that they have already begun the delivery of things they need, defensive equipment, radar equipment. So I would say that you see both sides getting all their ducks in a row, preparing for something large, even as they both say they don't want an all-out war, a regional conflagration, but nevertheless, the impacts both uh, on the populations here and in the countries surrounding Israel, you know, and possibly on the markets. I've read an analysis that says the stock market tumble is related to this too but there's a huge price being paid even before anything happens stock market, it, it's the total stock market is not unrelated to what's going on in asia and you know, in this whole region it, it's totally tied to what the what's going on in japan and the unraveling of carry trades so yes this is another journalist is not what Bangladesh parliament's been dissolved. Longtime opposition leader Begum Khalid Asaya freed from house arrest. The military taking the reins and appealing for calm after Monday's ouster of longtime Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. She was forced to flee to India after one of the bloodiest days of protests in the country's history. Talan Souza has been. A portrait of Bangladesh's Iron Lady lies in tatters a day after she resigned and fled to neighboring India. New Delhi confirmed Sheikh Hasina's present. Okay, so let's go to a commercial here. Please go to my store, bud-studio-reykjavik.com, and get the resveratrol. This gets rid of senesce cells. It's also an antioxidant. You should be coupling this with some of the other anti-aging stuff that I do, like C60. Um, so please go to my store and get the resveratrol. I take this every day as part of my anti-aging protocol and longevity protocol. Vitamin D3, important to absorb calcium. It's also important as a gene expression cofactor. 
you need vitamin D3 for proper cellular processes. In addition, if a cell is infected, you need vitamin D for the, that cell to go into apoptosis, to help for that cell to go into apoptosis. I have two types of probiotic. I have the powder probiotic that I take every day, it's just a little scooper, and you just mix it with food or water. Or you can also get a veggie cap version, all right? What's important is, is that you take probiotic every day. What that does is, is it helps to uh, reduce inflammation in the gut. It, it improves the energy absorption. It also improves metabolism. A lot of people don't realize that if you, you know, if you have, if you're eating poor, poor quality food and processed foods and very sugary foods, your gut biome gets all destroyed, all right? It's really important to boost it up. Especially the gut biome has been perturbed from the crisis in 2020. So the after effect, the after shock of the 2020 crisis, many people's guts are poor. In addition, people aren't filtering water, filtering their water and, and eating, you know, a proper diet and, and high quality food. Stop eating processed foods, stop eating sugary foods and make sure you filter your water and take a probiotic every day and you're going to notice that your health is going to improve and your skin will improve. You'll notice that skin health is correlated to the, the gut. Additionally, your mood will improve. A bad gut biome causes sluggishness and, and you know, uh, uh, reduced clarity, mental clarity, and depression. So it's really important to just realize a lot of the problems that people have start at the gut. So please go to my store and get the probiotics and take them every day. Olive leaf extract, really important to boost up your immune system and to improve your cardiovascular health. It boosts up your immune system by, by bringing down that inflammation and it boosts up your cardiovascular system by bringing down LDL and increasing HDL levels. Vitamin C, really important for your skin health. In addition, it helps with your immune system. If you're not feeling well, take a double dose. Vitamin C should be taken with water. And if you want to improve your skin, you should also take it with collagen. That will help with the cross-linking and improve the dermal layer. In addition, if you take C60 and resveratrol, that will improve the basal layer of your skin. So you'll notice that if you do all those together, you're going to be improving your skin and your other cells. In addition, topically, if you put the structural nanosilver gel, you'll start noticing that topically your skin is starting to tighten and get clearer. So it's important. Vitamin C for your immune system and for your skin. A lot of people are having problems sleeping, especially with what's going on. They're worried about their 401k, or they're worried about their investments, they're worried about their house, they're worried about you know their job, they're worried about what's going on in the world. A lot of people are having anxiety. Don't get anxious, just stay calm. But if you're having problems sleeping, you need to stop that cycle and get good sleep regularly. A great way to do that is to take my good night formula every night, right? And by doing that, you you will you will um, get a more well rested sleep. You're going to be when you wake up, you're going to have more energy. You're also detoxifying your body because your your body detoxifies when you're in deeper sleep. So it's really important to get the, those REM cycle sleeps. Three REM cycle sleeps are really important. In addition, it helps with memory. People that have chronic sleep deprivation have memory loss, have more toxins in their body, and over time, what will happen is that they will start having cognitive decline and their body is going to age faster. So sleep is a major pillar in an anti-aging protocol to, you know, to mitigate some of all these problems that we have in modern society. Go to my store, well-studio-rakevic.com, and get the good night.
Now, I want to let's let's drop into. Uh, This lady should carry that. Let's let's go to Bloomberg and just get go and uh, get an idea of what's gives you the power of AI to build the website you need with full business functionality and design. Focused after retaining his Olympic pole vault title and breaking his own world record yet again. The Swedish star known as Mondo had already secured the gold medal when he cleared 6 meters 25 with his final attempt in front of a packed crowd of nearly 70,000 in Paris. The 24-year-old is also a two-time world champion both outdoors and indoors. Duplantis is the first athlete to retain the Olympic pole vault title since American Bob Richards in 1952 and 56. Ukrainian great Sergei Bubka broke the world. All right, let's see here. Bloomberg now moving towards broadcast. <laughs> Access the financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists. Simply the policy went to stop. Armand the Plastic's gold medal was long in the bag when he asked for the uh, bar to be set for a world record height of 6.25 meters. We have the incredible sight of his rivals roaring him on as he made his attempts, just missing the first, just missing the second, and then one of the enduring split seconds of these Paris Olympics when he cleared the bar to break the world record for an incredible ninth time to fulfill his dream of breaking the world record while sealing an Olympic gold. And he was asked afterwards what's next for him, perhaps understandable that he wanted to live in the moment. Probably one of the moments where I care the least about the future is right now. I'm, I'm soaking up this right now. I mean... How, how could I care about anything else except this? Later on in the day, in the boxing, Algeria's Iman Khalif is in the semi-finals amid a XY chromosome dispute that has been affecting the women's boxing competition. All right, let's go to Bloomberg. Trillion dollar global wipeout. And as some fear, the great unwind has just begun. It's today's big take, and joining us now is Bloomberg Bailey Lipschultz, who's one of the authors on this story, of course, one of the most read. And this is a big worry, isn't it? That we saw this sell off yesterday, we saw volatility blow out, and really there's more to come. Well, that's the big uncertainty, and the big unknown to all is that no one knows if this is the, as we write, if this is the end of a three week pull down that really accelerated over the last three days, or if it's a sign of things to come. And when you look at volatility spiking like it did, and you look at the kind of rotation away from stocks that we've been seeing. It's no longer selling big tech to buy utilities. Everything was down sharply yesterday. Big question is, how does the Japanese yet play into that? How does the internet coming back in October of these markets, whether it's bonds, stocks, or even crypto, how does that play out? And perhaps a market that was more levered than that they had. Yeah, I think it's important to kind of explain the carry trade, at least in basic terms for viewers who aren't, you know, immersed in you know, like Shanali obviously talks about it every day. Um, but basically, you have a generation of traders who are borrowing again, selling them for dollars, and then putting the dollars into more profitable trades here, right? They haven't really seen this kind of snapback very often in terms of the yen going from, you know, 162 
to 140 in two weeks. No, precisely. And you see that it, July 3rd, we were at 161, almost 162 on the dollar yet. And now, as you mentioned, it is 144, Cole? Most of the people that are doing that are either traders or banks. Now, the traders and, you know, the hedge fund, you know, the institutional investor types, you know, right? They deserve to be clobbered by doing that move because they knew that risk was building up. The banks are more problematic because it may create systemic risk. Now, the Federal Reserve does oversight on the banks, especially the most important ones. And they would have known their, their carry trade exposure. So, and, and have these banks set provisions to absorb a shock because they do stress tests. I'm not too worried about it. And this is part of the reason why the market bounced back so quickly. This is not a Lehman moment. Trust me, this is not a Lehman moment. And this is not a COVID moment. And everyone that's saying it is, they're wrong. Now, what could happen is, is that some of the more uh, larger hedge funds, maybe even smaller banks that may have some sort of con contagious exposure with the hedge funds may be stressed, like what we saw with SVB back you know, more than a year ago. Maybe. That might happen in October. But we're not going to see like major, major sell-off where the S&P 500 is going to be going down 25% or something or 30%. That's not, that's not going to happen. All right. So don't worry about it. And I told you what those resistance levels are. So if you pay attention to me and those resistance levels are, are triggered with the market going down, that's the time to buy, not the time to panic. I close that 140 level that we saw coming into the year. So as you mentioned, if you're borrowing in because it's the interest is so low and the cost is so cheap to then deploy it, whether that's into bonds, whether that's into NVIDIA, the MAG7 names, when those trades unwind, you're forced to sell to then bring that back. To right. They, they owe the 161 exactly. and now their dollar only buys 140. So they need to spend more to get that money back. And this goes back to, and I've been covering markets for a number of years, and you have conversations, whether you're an industry specialist or a macro investor, you wind and unwind trades. So we're seeing that unwinding because people are piled into similar trades. Now that's a massive unwind with a carry now trade. Now think There's about another... what they're saying. Currency fluctuation perturbs the market. This is the reason why currencies need to be stable. All right? Because if you have, a, it, like in the end, 162 and then it drops down to 142 in such a short amount of time, in, in less than a month or about a month, that's, an, that's a problem because, you know, you're rebalancing maybe every, you know, it depends on the institution. Sometimes you're rebalancing every day, but, you know, a lot of these institutions are rebalancing weekly or, you know, bi-monthly or, you know, monthly, whatever. So if it's, if there's large moves, it causes problems on the balance sheet. This is the reason why Bitcoin cannot be used as a a, a stored value of transaction. It's an asset. Bitcoin is an is a virtual asset that trades like a commodity. All right, but a high volatile commodity, and you can't store real transactional value in it because it's so volatile. This is the problem. Now, most currencies for developed nations don't have this kind of fluctuation. This is kind of a rare fluctuation move, all right? But with Bitcoin, that fluctuation is every day. You can't, this is the reason why it would make global finance less stable, not more stable. Now, there are going to be these people, well, things are different with technology and all this stuff. No, think, when someone says things are different, or there's a new normal, that's total horseshit. It's, it's not true. It means that they're trying 
either they don't know the basics of, of economics or they want to pretend that the, the laws of economics don't exist for their own benefit. It's either it's either they're ignorant or they're trying to pretend that an economic law doesn't exist. So with that, you know, can people make money in Bitcoin? Yes, as a trading kind of commodity, but it's not a stored value for transaction. And this right here proves my point. Now, if you don't understand what I am saying, then I can't help you. But this right here, with the fluctuation of the yen, proves why Bitcoin will not work as a transactional currency. Wonky dynamic here, and that is the, all the people who are having to sell volatility into this market. And you saw that panic level of 65 yesterday. You're now back down to about 31. Still, 31 is relatively elevated to where we've been. Bailey, you cover the capital market. So there's so going to be volatile. There was an IPO comeback. There was a bond market comeback in terms of issuance. A VIX at 30, does that ruin all of that hope? Well, the one thing when you look at it, especially with new issuance, August is so quiet historically. So we're already, we happen to be in a month where people aren't actually going to raise capital. Pain could have been this. worse. Exactly. If this happened post Labor Day when we're penciling in a lot of these bigger deals, the last real window when I talk to uh, capital markets bankers, that's when the pain could be kind of more drawn out and more uh, kind of dire for would-be issuers. Whereas, again, we're seeing the turnaround Tuesday not really play out. But the big question is what happens in the coming days and weeks, just given for the most part, big tech earnings are behind us. And a lot of those seasonal factors are going to wait. Typically, we see August and September being weak. A lot of people are lucky this happened in August. You know, they're sitting at the Paris Olympics watching their yes. <laughs> I think you're lucky already if you're sitting at the Paris Olympics. Uh, Bailey, thanks very much. Bloomberg Bailey Lick Schultz there talking to us about the unwinding of the carry trade. Uh, coming up in the next hour, Lucid CEO Peter Rollinson is going to join us at 1030 a.m. Eastern. We'll talk to him about his earnings and the cash injection they got from Saudi Arabia. This is Bloomberg. All right. Let me do another commercial and then we'll continue on the market. Maybe I can find something about what was going on in Iraq. Please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com and get the turmeric. This will bring down inflammation. This will help to lower those pro-inflammatory cytokines and reduce that chronic inflammation that disturbs your immune system and and when your immune system is disturbed and you have chronic inflammation, you age faster, you want to slow that down, right? So by taking turmeric, you're going to slow down the aging process, but you're going to be bringing down that chronic inflammation, right? So that's really important. And it's an antioxidant, so it's going to reduce the stress in the cell. It's synergistic with ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is really important to help control blood glucose levels and improve that cardiovascular health. How? By bringing down inflammation. See, there's a key here. Bring down inflammation and your immune system heals and boosts up when you slow down the aging process. Chronic inflammation leads to faster aging. Lignans, very important to boost up your immune system. It's a powder, you take it every day, you mix it either with water or with food, right? There's a little scooper in here, so you just take it with take one scoop a day, all right? In addition to boosting up your immune system, it also helps with your hormonal health for males and females. That's important, why? Because our endocrine system, because of our modern society, by us breathing in certain types of toxins, by us, you know, drinking, you know, uh, uh, toxins and chemicals that are in our water and in our food, that our endocrine system gets disturbed. And that's why it's important to filter your water, stay away from processed foods. You know what? Most restaurants are terrible to eat at if you really want to analyze it. It may taste good, but it's actually pretty bad. All right. So just be, you know, just be cognizant that what you put in your body is going to affect your 
immune system and your endocrine system. All right. So filter your water, stay away from processed foods, stay away from sugary foods, reduce your intake of eating out because most restaurants, not all, but most restaurants are terrible for you. And just eat better. Diet, exercise properly, proper supplementation, and you're going to go a long way in healing the body. The gut biome, you know, improvement by taking the probiotic, by bringing down inflammation, by taking these things that I'm telling you to take, and taking ligands. Ligands is very important. Boost up that immune system and improve your hormonal health. It's for males and females. Endocrine system is a major component to good health and slowing down the aging process and for you to have energy. Multivitamin. I have a very easy to digest multivitamin. You should be taking this every day, add it to your daily routine. You need multivitamins as cofactors for enzymatic activity in your cells. Why? Because those enzymes have little little regions where these multi some of these vitamins will attach to and it improves the shape of that enzyme and the activity is better. So by having multivitamins, you're gonna have better cellular activity, better metabolism. Vitamin B complex, extremely important for cellular metabolism. The first five B vitamins, B1, B2, B3, B4, and B5, help with the mitochondria. Mitochondria makes your energy, your ATP. If you, you know, aren't getting enough B vitamins, especially when you get older, your ATP goes down. I've been telling everybody, mitochondrial health is really important to slow down the aging process and to maintain energy levels. So please go to my store and get the vitamin B complex. Uh, Mark Mattel, Senior Portfolio Manager, All Street Global Investments, is going to join us to give us her market thoughts here on what has been a very tumultuous uh, last several days in the marketplace. We do have green on the screen right now. Let's kick everything off. We'll check in with Lisa Mattel. You got it. Market Drivers brought to you by Interactive Brokers Bond Marketplace. Access their vast selection of over 1 million global fixed income security with no markups or built-in spreads and low transparent commissions. Learn more at ibkr.com slash bonds. All right, markets battling back after this three-day sell-off. Traders looking for bargains. The Goldman Sachs analysis of four decades of data which shows buying the S&P 500 after a 5% drop is usually profitable, but city strategists, well, they recommend waiting before buying a dip. We have the NASDAQ now up about half percent, 80 points at 16,282. The S&P 500 up nine tenths of percent, 47 points, 5,233. The Dow up eight tenths of percent, 327 points at 39,036. Tech stocks really took a hit yesterday, especially NVIDIA. I want to check in with a few of them. We have NVIDIA up about two and a half percent, more than two and a half percent. Tesla down half a percent. Microsoft up about one and a half percent, but Amazon down half percent and Apple down more than two and a half percent. On the bond market, we have the two year yield 3.94 percent. That's up two basis points. The yield on the 10 year 3.83 percent. And that's a four basis point. It was a global sell-off yesterday, so I want to take a little wider look. We'll look at the stock 600 right now, up about a tenth of a percent. The Nikkei, quite a difference from yesterday, up 10%. And as far as currencies, the Japanese yen down about a tenth of a percent at 144.44 against the dollar. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. All in All right, thank you so much, Lisa and Mateo. So I kind of say, after the last two trading days, this is like a letdown. Right. So I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, stocks are up. Dow's at 350 points. Um, I was mentioning this yesterday when I was on the close, though. There's been so many reports of so much systemic funds, so like ball trading funds, uh, CTAs, that have much more to sell. And that right. gamma hedging could also be uh, set up to sell, too. I just don't buy this rally. I mean, I'm the, I think you I'm going to talk about out. dead cats. Okay. I'm going to okay. talk about some dead cats bouncing okay. uh, over the next uh, couple hours. Uh, Norma Linda joins us in studio with some stats to watch. Um, all right, you're looking at individual movers, not the dead cats bouncing, but uh, Lucid really delivering. It 500 is a major support level for SPY. 483 is a major support level for SPY. 457 is a major support level for SPY. And 430 is a major support level for SPY. The 
even if there is a correction, which I don't think in the short term is, is happening here, um, there are perfect opportunities to buy it with those, those resistance points that, I, that I've said. And I've been expecting something like this to be happening I'm a little surprised, like I said yesterday, that I'm a little surprised that that uh, we didn't hit the 500 mark. That just proves that the market's actually more resilient, all right? And there was no, if you listen to all these people, they were saying, oh, there's gonna be an emergency Fed, you know, cut rate and all that. It didn't happen, it didn't happen. I still have set my year-end target at, at 5,800 for, S&P 500, which is 580 on SPY, all right? There's a small chance of it reaching 600 or 6,000 on S&P 500, depending on if you look at the index or the ETF, all right? Small chance. So we're gonna be probably higher at the end of the year. It doesn't mean that we're, gonna have, we're not gonna have volatility. Volatility is still elevated, it's, it's in the thirds but we had super low volatility in the 12s for so long, 12, 13, 14, and then dropped out. It's for so long that it's kind of averaging out now, you know, with this high volatility. So we, we peaked, I think at 64 VIX yesterday, and then it went down to fifties and then it slowly went down back down to the thirties. So normally these heterocydastic spikes happen every two and a half, three months. That takes you into October. So it's not a, it, you know, as Alex, uh, uh, is it Alex Steele? I think her name is, um, said, she thinks it's a cat, dead cat bounce. Um, no, I don't think so. We may see another elevated risk emerge because of some sort of counterparty thing that happens in October. That might happen. But, most likely, as we're moving towards October, we may actually see the S and P 500 get back to five, you know, five thousand four hundred and or five thousand five hundred. Right now, it's trading at five thousand two hundred forty-eight. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that by October, this is back to five thousand four hundred. So, and then if things are stable in October then most likely the 5,800 mark would be breached by the end of the year. Assuming that nothing catastrophic happens in the Middle East or in Asia or in Europe in terms of war, there's no you know, super price shock in terms of oil that causes additional inflation and you know, no you know, major, you know, major incident um, in the markets you know, tied to some sort of counterparty risk. Because there could be some counterparty risk that's developing that's hard to capture, but we don't know. But the way I see this is that there is more upside to this than downside. In Within August through December, now reevaluate when new data comes in, like data that's coming in in, September, there's Jackson Hole meeting, I think at the end of August, beginning of September, I think it's the end of August, and um, see if there's an event that takes place in October. Then you have the election. You're going to, you know, who knows how the market will go up or down, you know, because of the election, but that will be just a knee-jerk reaction. And then, you know, the question is, is, is the market stable? The moment that the Federal Reserve starts to, to lower rates the chances are the market's going to rally in the long in in the medium to long term short term you know the first day or two it might go down it might go up but the long term trend is going to be going up because it's more money in the market where's the money going to go it's going to go into equities so it, it, either way it's it, you know and it's probably all some of that hot money is also going to probably be going overseas for international investing You'll probably hear some hedge fund guys and, and some institutional investors say, oh, invest in Europe or invest in Asia. That I would stay away from. Don't invest in Europe and don't invest in Asia, even if you're trying to chase yield. All right. Um, 
you know, and, and, and trying to chase a, you know, a higher return. Don't do that. Stay in the United States. Geopolitically, the international affairs is too volatile right now. Stay in the United States. Here we are seeing shares of Lucid jumping as much as 13%, now pairing a bit. But this is after a large cash infusion of as much as one and a half billion dollars from an affiliate of Saudi Arabia's public investment funds. We are getting a uh, Cantor Fitzgerald upgrading the stock to neutral from sell coming off of this news. But one thing to note that while uh 1.5 billion dollars seems like a lot, this is on the heels of a $1 billion injection that we did see in March. 50% is convertible, 50% is an unsecured loan. But in reality, this is really not a lot of money, uh, especially with the company having a negative free cash flow uh, for some $750 million a quarter still. Uh, it's only quarter. really, yes, oh, okay. so pretty, pretty strong and very intense there. Uh, so it's not really making progress on its scaling as it's really trying to scale the company. And it's only selling, uh, not too crazy amount of cars here. So the stock is still down about 29% for the year through yesterday's close. And of course we do hear from Rivian tonight with those earnings coming out. I'm just looking at the uh, FA function for Lucid and the free cash flow forecast from the street for 2024, negative 3.5 billion, a little bit better next year to negative 3 billion, but still it seems like it's a ways away from free cash flow positive. Yeah, right, so important to know. How about Rivian too? Didn't Volkswagen uh, make an investment in cash infusion into Rivian also? Right. So clearly like the startups that have the technology to do the stuff still though uh, need the cash. You're, speaking of, Uber. Yes, let's take a look at Uber. We're seeing shares up for the most since February, up as much as 7.3%. Now this is after better than expected orders. We're still seeing demand for ride share and delivery services. It saw gross bookings that grew 19% last quarter, citing that there was particularly strength in Latin America and the Asia Pacific. Of course, you know, all eyes, we are keeping an eye on Lyft, which will be reporting results before the opening bell tomorrow, but this is a strong report from Uber. I, I don't know. I guess I, I'm not sure if I asked you guys before. Mm -hmm. Do you comparison shop Uber versus Lyft, or do you just go right to the No, that's a pulse. I do. You do? I, think I everyone do. Uses I open both apps, and yes. I also open thirdly the Curb app, which is great for New York City, and I see which one's the cheapest. Yeah, I would click on that one. See, that's why I like it. Okay, I'm yeah. super behind on that. So yes. apparently. You and Matt Miller just go right to Uber. Yeah. Wow. Brand loyalty. But this is so or laziness. I'm not sure. What it's it's laziness. Okay. But 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 is this like is this a good thing for Lyft or for Uber? Because Lyft is undercutting people. Me. On, on I want to go to Al Jazeera here on this West Bank. Oh, that the Israeli forces have surrounded this area. And as we were walking, we saw some traces of blood, some uh, clothes filled with blood as well. And Palestinians, because this area is very far away from the downtown, from the center of the village, they've been not allowed to approach and come closer to this location. This is why after hours, of the start of the incident and the Israeli forces surrounding the home that they managed to get in and try to understand really what happened. Now, medical teams say that they've seen the Israeli forces take Palestinians with them, five in total, some injured, some dead. But here, people do not have answers. The Ministry of Health says that it received information from the Israeli side that two Palestinians were killed here, as opposed to the initial announcement that three were killed. So the, the, the story we have now is two Palestinians killed, three injured, but all of them have been taken with the Israeli forces with them. Again, Palestinians would tell you that it's hard to know what happened. Did they uh, have a shootout? Did they not? Did they kill them in cold blood. It's hard for Palestinians here to know what happened because this is once again another story of the Israeli forces coming in, raiding Palestinian homes, towns, refugee camps, and leaving with casualties. We have Al Jazeera live from Doha. More still to bring you on the program. M23 rebels make advances in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, prompting a it just seems like the whole world going to hell. It's like if you watch international news, you realize how much of a shithole the world is. What happens with the online? What happens with Japanese stocks overnight? Because that will largely frame the case. It's very rare, honestly, that you see Asia lead 
the yeah. U.S. Mm -hmm. It usually is a U.S. lead. So we're sitting in a bit of an awkward position right now. Um, you know, there have been other factors certainly weighing on stocks. What is the Fed going to do? What, are they removing fast enough? Is the tech sector sort of losing its panache as a leader? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of other things that we need to consider in the U.S., but the biggest, boldest thing I think to watch right now is really what happens with Japan and this carry trade unwind. It doesn't create forced liquidity selling um, across the spectrum of asset classes. Was there panic selling yesterday, particularly in the morning? Did you think worse? I thought so in the morning. I mean, you, you pretty rarely see the VIX spike above 60. Yeah. Without was, yeah. 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 The day Tom King was yeah. not here, the King of the Oh, I know. He missed, he missed out. He must be really kicking himself. But it was, uh, yeah, it was definitely very panicky over Sunday night. And again, that was really related to Asia and what happened with the Japanese assets just crashing over the course of the weekend. So, it calmed throughout the day, which is a pretty good sign for the U.S. being able to come in and bring some stability. And right now, uh, the the, ISS right now, the VIX, as I'm recording, the VIX is now at 27. It was in the 30s as we started, but now it's 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 calming down. This is what I mean by the heterocydastic aspect of the of VIX, the volatility index. There's going to be another. Most likely, there's a high probability of another event to happen in October. Because it happened, these spikes happen. You don't know what the magnitude is, but at least that signal happens every two and a half to three months. And it's partially due to the way banks and institutional investors fund their operations. This number obviously yes. helps a little bit with sentiment. The earnings numbers that we have gotten over the course of the last few days have been fairly stable. Mm -hmm. So from a fundamental perspective, you know, I think that we're in relatively solid ground here in the U.S., but there's a lot of uncertainty with respect to the financial market stability kind of coming out of this first in 17 year move out of the Japanese yeah. central bank, which is not a small thing. So I just want to clarify what dead cat bounce is because Samantha, one of our producers, mentioned it. So basically it is uh, a rally in a downtrend. So stocks bounce, but the trend is still lower. And we talk about dead cats because... Cats always land on their feet. I, there's something about the cats. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, She's so it. wrong. Um, what do you think? The trend, all right. To have a trend, you have to have at least three points. The trend is upward. So you need several of these down, you need at least three down trends to be able to say that that fourth time was a dead cat bounce. You know, we don't have that. We have an upward trend. It's not, it's, I'm telling you, just stick with what I'm saying. The FIB sequence is saying what the, str the strength levels are. It'll need to be, it needs to be reevaluated once we hit the 6,000 mark. Then there, then, then there may be a new structure that is happening and there may be a downturn. But that goal of getting to 6,000 is a, is that the momentum there is, is very real, very real. Know or how do we know if the carry trade unwinds is over? Because the funny thing is, if the Fed did like an emergency rate cut, that would make the carry make trade worse. worse because yes. then the yen would rally even more. Yep, I, I totally agree with you. And this is where some of the popular sentiment has gotten it wrong. Is this is not necessarily just about the U.S. and the U.S. specifically, and is the U.S. data weak enough to really justify a Fed cut? The consequences of a Fed cut right now are pretty high outside of the U.S and it might ex actually exacerbate the problem. So the Fed sitting on hold, I do believe is the right thing to do. It seems to be where they're headed. Uh, and these calls for the need for a Fed cut are probably somewhat misplaced in my mind. Well, how will we know? Uh, you know, you won't know in a day, you probably won't know in a week, you'll only know in hindsight <laughs> that it's over. What I will say is there are some key indicators that would suggest we actually, you know, though we've had a 10% correction in stocks, we haven't even really tested the longer term bull uptrend. And so as long as stocks are still trading above their 200 and moving average, you're technically still in an uptrend. 70% of stocks in the S&P 500 are still trading above their own indiv individual 200 and moving average. So we're still in the longer term bull market. We're just in some kind of corrective phase in that bull market. When will it end? Well, it'll end when the last seller has left the building right. and we finally get some buyers coming into the market. You finally get some leadership emerging on the market that is not defensive in nature. Uh, low vol stocks start to underperform high vol stocks. You get a little bit of risk on in small caps, then you'll know. 
but things are definitely over. The risk has cleared, but uh, I would watch Japan very, very carefully. You need to see some stability there first in this instance. And and that's why I was saying, so much we appreciate it. As always, my, my, risk, my risk indicators are VIX, oil, and yen to USD. Those are, if you start seeing that, you know, there are, that they're, they're moving in a direction where there's elevated risk, then markets are going to sell. If it's elevate, if there's less risk in the markets, then markets are going to rally. Oil is suppressed right now. It's trading in 70, right now it's trading at $73 a barrel. VIX is, is elevated. So that's risk. That's a risk. Oil is low in relative terms because it's been trading in the high 70s or even the low 80s for quite a while. And the yen is strengthening in the last month by a lot. That's a risk. Okay. So you have two, you have two risk indicators that are saying that markets are going to have, there's going to be tumultuous time. But then you have to look at the FIB sequence of the macro index. I take a look at the, the, the SPY as an ETF, or you can just look at the S&P 500. But either way, they, the, structure, the structure of the price curve is such, either looking at moving averages or looking at FIB sequences, that it's going to move upward, not downward. So it's be cautious, but the overall momentum is upward. She is the uh, US equity uh, strategist that we rely upon. Uh, she's over there at Bloomberg Intelligence. I have no idea who she reports to anymore. It's just whole different thing going on there. Let's check out Ira Jersey. <laughs> he is a rates strategist. Yes, that is a job. You can build a career being a rates strategist on Wall Street. Ira is uh, proof perfect of that. Ira, what's your Federal Reserve going to do? It's not going to come in and do an emergency rate cut, is it? Yeah, it's, there's been so much talk about that for the last 24 hours. It's actually kind of uh, making me ill. Um, <laughs> Um, that's why I'm working from home today. Uh, but but the uh, you know the Fed's not going to come in just because the stock market's down five, six, seven percent, right? The, the, the Federal Reserve um, is going to cut rates because they think that the economy is faltering and because uh, the unemployment rate's going up and because they're worried that the economy will fall further. Now, oftentimes that happens when the equity market is down quite a lot because the, that's often a signal that we're going into a recession. We're going to have an earnings slowdown. We're going to have uh, profitability is going to be weak. We're going to have weak retail sales, all of those kind of things. So, um, yeah, you know, it's not only one thing. Um, you know, the, the Fed would step in and try to provide some liquidity to markets if they thought the market wasn't functioning. But I think uh, in what you saw in the, a lot of the price action yesterday, the markets were functioning, right? They just mm -hmm. the price going down doesn't mean the market's not functioning. That that's two two completely different things. Um, the the bond market, I think, is. Uh, um, you know, rethinking the whole idea that the Fed is going to have an intermediate cut, not the Fed's going to cut even further. But look, just look at two-year yields. Two-year yields just in the last couple of weeks are down 50 basis points. And that's uh, effectively saying, it's uh, the market saying that we think the Fed's going to cut more than we thought a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think that that's reasonable. And that's been in our forecast for basically the whole year um, because it, the market's basically pricing out all of the tail risk that we're going to have a very soft landing where the Fed might only need to ease 50 or 75 basis points. And I think that that's kind of what you're seeing in, in a lot of the, the price action volatility aside. I mean, like kind of the, the longer term kind of two, three week uh, price action here. Ira, do we know what positioning looks like yet after sort of that wash? I don't want to say wash out because there's a lot of buying, but that sort of cratering in yields. Well, there was, there was certainly a lot of short covering in that. And we talked about that yesterday, Alex. Um, yeah, you know, one of the, uh, we, we, it's not, you know, who's positioned which way. You, you look at something like the J.P. Morgan survey of Treasury sentiment, and you see that their active investor sentiment index is now negative, suggesting that active investors are short. But then you look at their overall index, so that, so that just everybody, and they're continuing to be long. Um, and and that's, that's a pretty unusual situation, actually, for that particular indicator. Um, you know, a lot of investors that we've spoken to are kind of, 
wait and see. They're sitting on their hands. Um, th those who are long are obviously pretty happy um, and, and probably going to remain in those positions. Um, and those short are certainly getting nervous, right? So I think that that's showing you that that you when you get moves like we had yesterday, firstly, it was on the back of, of the equity market swimming, right? Virginia just talked about why she thought that was. I'm a little bit more skeptical that it's all about the carry trade. But um, but but the, the the idea that when you have equities down 4%, you're, you're going to go have a play your quality trade. And that's what, is what we saw. And that will scare shorts into covering those shorts. And that just makes these moves more dramatic and why you have these, these bounce back that can be pretty significant, but but we are in a lot of new levels, and I think that at this point, the market, uh, the treasury market anyway, is going to be looking for new levels to sit in from now until uh, until the September meeting when the Federal Reserve is likely to cut interest rates, and then the future guidance of that. Right, we get new dots, we get the new summary of economic projections. Plus, obviously, Jay Powell might say, "Hey, this is just the start of a string of cuts." Or he might say, we're not really sure how far we're going to have to go here. And, and that can wind up creating more volatility in, in uh, the Treasury market as well. All right, I want to get to the important stuff here. Today, semifinals, Olympics, soccer, men's soccer. Uh, I'm sorry, where are we in the soccer for the men's in the Olympics, Ira? Uh, the U.S. men uh, bowed out. We lost out. four nails to a very good Morocco team uh, in, the, in the quarterfinals. So uh, Morocco's looking very good. I would not be surprised at all. Well, up winning this tournament, so the, the, well, I see the tournament is under 23. So I guess yesterday, so yesterday Spain, Spain beat Morocco two to one. So now we got in the finals for the Olympics, France versus Spain. That seems like how it should be, right? Aren't they kind of two of the best around? Yeah, them? it's it's hard to know with the under 23 tournaments like this because the, the you know they, they're not the marquee names, so it's a little bit more difficult. I, I'm I'm a little bit more interested to see how the U.S. women do because the U.S. women uh, are ranked fifth yes. in the world. And um, and it's it's an interesting tournament. And Emma Hayes, the new manager, really has not rotated many of the players. So um, will the U.S. women have enough fitness in order to go further? We play Germany again, who wow. which is a team that we beat pretty soundly in the group stage. Um, so we play them again in the semifinals. And then you know once we get to the finals, um, you know obviously we'll be playing for for a medal. We're effectively playing for a medal this game, right? Uh, because presumably. Um, you know, we'll, we'll be in the bronze medal match at the worst, but we'd like to obviously be in. So the S&P 500 is up over 1%. It's just slightly up more than 1%. Everything's stable. So it's playing just exactly like I thought. And I should point out, noon is when uh, the soccer tournament with semifinals uh, kicks off. So I know nothing about sports, but I'm super into the Olympics. So this is okay. like the one time in my life for 14 <laughs> days. Where I find her voice so annoying. Please go to my store, the the dash studio dash .com. It's the dash studio dash .com. and get the magnesium and zinc. This will help boost up your immune system. Take it every day. It should be part of your daily routine. If you're not feeling well, take a double dose. Omega three, very important to help with cardiovascular health. What it does is that it brings down the LDL and increases your HDL levels. So this is helping with your lipid profile. In addition, omega-3 helps to prevent the red blood cells from sticking together. So this is important to just maintain good and improve your cardiovascular health. We should be taking it every day. I have these, I have a skincare bar, utility bar, that I've partnered up with, with Rainbow Herbals. And this is made from all essential oils from the Himalayas. This is a dual use pro product. You can put it on your skin every day or every third day. And what you'll notice is that your skin is nice and smooth, soft, and it has like a little bit of a glow to it. In addition, you can put it on the cut or an abrasion or a minor burn and it'll help to heal it quicker. And if you pull a muscle, if you have a muscle ache or a little bit of an arthritic feel, you can apply it and you'll notice that you are getting pain relief. In many cases, it will eliminate the pain. It happens in about 60 seconds, 30 seconds, depending on what the situation is. In addition, you know, people are outside, they might get a mosquito bite. And it itches, apply it on that on that bite, and what will happen is the itch the itching will go away. 
So there, there's the, this product is amazing. It's very high quality. It's made from essential oils from the Himalayas. So please go to my store, the-studio-reykjavik.com. The link is in the description of this video and get the even better product. Very high quality. You really need to have that in your medicine cabinet. And we have created these deodorant bars. These are for males and females. It's in citrus and peppermint, lavender, and tea tree. It's a very high quality deodorant. It has no aluminum in it and it has no baking soda in it. So please go to the store and get these, these deodorant bars. Use it every day, but it's dual purpose. It also helps to slowly detoxify your body. For males and females, get a couple bars of this for your household. It's a very high quality product. It's going to be the best deodorant that you're going to be able to buy. So please go to the store, the-studio-rapepick.com. In addition, I have C60 on my store. It's a very strong antioxidant. I have it in a two ounce, a four ounce, or an eight ounce configuration. What does C60 do? C60 soaks up free radicals in your cells, in your tissue, and reduces that cellular and tissue stress. When you do that, you're slowing down the aging process and, it, and those tissues and those cells will perform better. It will also help to boost up your mitochondrial health and you'll see an e, your ATP to go up. That's really important for neural health. That's really important for the immune system. So please go to the store and get C60. It's a very potent, antioxidant. You should be taking a teaspoon of this a day. I have it in a two ounce, a four ounce, and an eight ounce configuration. You should take it on an empty stomach for best absorption. And if you work out, take it before your workout because you will notice that your recovery time is quicker. So I have it in extra virgin olive oil. I have it in avocado oil and also MCT coconut oil. So please go to the store and get the C60. Take a teaspoon of it a day. With that said, thank you for listening. Hopefully, hopefully you uh, have not panicked. You know, with the whole market disturbance yesterday, things are stabilized. I'm not too worried about it right now. But I do think that something may happen in the market in October because this heterocydastic spike happens every two and a half to, th to three months. We start seeing these things. So things are stable, but just, just you know, there may be some, some um, rough waters in October. I still have a target of about 5,800 on the S&P 500. That's, so the market's cut by the end of the year. I think it'll go well. So uh, things will, might change depending on geopolitical or energy related or whatever. But as of right now, that's where I think this is going. So don't panic. And if a, if one of those support levels are triggered, then that's when you start investing back in. Right now, if you have money on the side, you know, it might be best to just kind of hold it. If you're if you are already invested in the market, you know, the money that's on the side, wait until one of those trigger points. And I've been updating as the market goes up, I've been updating what those support levels are. And Right now, that sell-off did not trigger the first support level, which was 500 for SPY, or 5,000 for S&P 500. The lowest it went was like uh, 5,112, 5, I think it was. So um, it didn't hit that, tar that, that target point. If it doesn't hit a target point, just be patient, right? That's all you gotta do, just be patient. Just but if you listen to some other people that are doing podcasts about the market, oh, it's all going to crash and blah, blah, blah. Uh, who was right? Who was wrong? They were wrong and I was right. So please pay attention to my, my you know, advice on this. And also please go to my store and help support my work. It's the-studio-reykjavik.com. And please ask your social media to follow me. Thank you for your help and your continued support. And have a nice day.